I'm Carl Azuz for CNN 10. Welcome to the show. We have a lot to tell you about in the next 10 minutes, starting with a papal visit to the Southeast Asian country of Myanmar, also known as Burma. Yesterday, Pope Francis, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, became the first pope to visit Myanmar. His three-day stay there will be immediately followed by a trip to neighboring Bangladesh. Both of those countries are involved in the plight of the Rohingya. This is a Muslim group that's a minority in Myanmar. The country has a population of more than 55 million, most of them Buddhist. Fewer than a million people there are Rohingya. Most of them live in a western state of Myanmar that partly borders Bangladesh, and more than 623,000 Rohingya have crossed that border into Bangladesh. Why? The United States, the United Kingdom, and the United Nations all accuse Myanmar's military of ethnic cleansing, using violence to rid the country of the Rohingya. Myanmar's leaders have denied doing this, saying they're not targeting civilians, but instead terrorists who've attacked the military. So this is one of the issues that's foremost on the Pope's mind as he stays in Myanmar. In the past, he's called the Rohingya his persecuted brothers and sisters who are being, quote, tortured and killed. But because Myanmar's leaders deny that and see the Rohingya as belonging to Bangladesh anyway, experts say the Pope will have to discuss the situation very carefully to avoid offending his hosts. Funeral for a fallen man. This was the scene in January after the brazen daylight shooting of a well-known lawyer in Myanmar. The victim, Koni, was an outspoken member of Myanmar's tiny Muslim religious minority. His daughter says he was gunned down while cradling his two-year-old grandson outside Yangon International Airport. And when I turned around and looked, and my father was on ground, so I just ran and helped him. But at the time, there's no sign of life. Koni's killing came during a surge of religious tension in this overwhelmingly Buddhist country, a phenomenon CNN reported on two years ago. Who is threatening Buddhism in this country? Muslim. Muslims only make up around 5% of the population, but some Buddhist monks preach that they pose an existential threat to the country. We are worried they will explode our ethnic heritage, cultural buildings, religious monuments, and our brethren when they carry out suicide bombings. Nowhere is this fear of Muslims more acute than in Rakhine State, where a deadly attack by Rohingya Muslim militants against security forces last August triggered a campaign of reprisals. More than 600,000 Rohingya Muslims have since been driven from their homes across the border to neighboring Bangladesh. Refugees accuse the military of torching their villages, mass rape and murder. Myanmar says it's fighting against a terrorist insurgency and denies deliberately attacking civilians. The U.S. and the United Nations call it ethnic cleansing. There's little public sympathy in Myanmar for the Rohingya. For decades, authorities labeled them illegal immigrants and denied them citizenship. The Rohingya crisis has raised fears among other Muslims in Myanmar who do enjoy full citizenship rights. The hate speech overwhelmed the minds of most of the people in Myanmar. If you look at these people, it's all because of fear. And because of this fear, they are afraid of us, and we are afraid of them. 10 second trivia. Tim Berners-Lee is famous for his invention of what? The smartphone, the World Wide Web, the personal computer, or the iOS operating system? Berners-Lee, a British computer scientist, is credited with inventing the World Wide Web in 1989. What is net neutrality? It has nothing to do with a volleyball or a tennis court. The net refers to the internet, something that's become as necessary as water and power for most of us. The neutrality part is about keeping the net the way it is today. It's a set of rules the FCC approved in 2010 to prevent speed traps on the information superhighway. In other words, speeding up access to some sites and slowing down access to others or blocking certain sites entirely. So are these rules a bad thing? It depends who you ask. 
The companies that deliver your internet, like Comcast, Verizon, and AT&T, have spent millions in lobbying money to get rid of net neutrality, arguing that having the government micromanage their business is not good for them or their consumers. On the other side are internet giants like Facebook and Google, streaming services like Netflix. They all argue the internet is a public good and should be regulated like one. They also say the companies that own the pipelines can play favorites. For example, a content provider like Netflix is in direct competition with Comcast, which owns NBC Universal and controls access to the internet for more than 20 million customers. You can imagine a scenario where NBC might want to speed up streams of its shows and slow down streams of its rival Netflix. Now, Netflix can afford to pay for a fast lane. They make $4 billion a year. But the next Netflix, some awesome startup, can't. So under current rules of net neutrality, which were approved during the Obama administration in 2015, internet providers like AT&T and Comcast are not allowed to speed up or slow down internet traffic to specific websites and apps. And they're not allowed to give priority to their own content. But now, during the Trump administration, the Federal Communications Commission has proposed doing away with those rules but it would require any companies that block, slow down, or prioritize certain sites to publicly show it, and then the government would decide whether that was fair or not. The FCC's chairman says this would stop the government from micromanaging the internet, and the proposal is supported by telecommunications trade groups. But critics call this the end of net neutrality as we know it, and the proposal is generally opposed by consumer advocacy groups. The FCC is expected to vote on and approve the proposal on December 14th. Center in Atlanta is located near what used to be the Georgia Dome, the former home of the Atlanta Falcons that hosted more than 1,400 events over its 25 years of operating. So when it was imploded last week, we had some great camera angles to choose from while telling you the story. The Weather Channel, unfortunately, did not get the best one. Oh, it set up a camera to capture the event, but the view was blocked by a bus stop. When the Georgia Dome imploded Monday, cameras caught it from lots of cool angles, except for this angle, where the camera operators were the ones to implode. Come on, bus, get out of the way. Bus. Get out of the way, bus. Are you? Weather Channel digital video producer Jason Rudge was behind this camera. We're all kind of whispering in anger. An epic photobomb, the Weather Channel called it. Critics weren't so kind. Amateur, their spelling, should have been on the other side of the road. Everyone keeps saying, how come this idiot's set up at a bus stop? Jason explained he and half a dozen other crews were on a media platform. The road was supposed to be closed, and the bus driver? She wanted to stop and catch the show herself. Is there anything you want to say to that bus driver? I'm not mad at her, because if I was driving by, I would have wanted to see it myself. Genimo, CNN, New York. Even if it caused fireworks when the bus blew out his chute by photobombing his angle, sparking his anger, leaving him fuming at the driver, and then collapse in a heat of deflatedness with nothing but rubble for footage to scrape back to the studio, sometimes, even when things go up in smoke, you still capture a great story that makes others erupt with laughter. I'm Carl Azus for CNN 10.